approach with the FBI and that's the crime rate of 73. Bill's areas of specialty are in the area of question documents, true print, and entire impression evidence. Uh, we're happy to have uh, Bill come all the way from Quonsco uh, this morning to uh, give us a presentation on true area of entire impression evidence. Bill asked me to uh, let you know that uh, he is process of publishing a book entitled <coughs> Footwear Impression Evidence will be published by Bill Savior and he expects that the publishing will, publishing will begin in uh, November of uh, 1990. One thing I'd like to uh, mention is uh, we would prefer that there be no smoking except for the breaks this morning. There will be a hosted break around 10 o'clock and some periodic breaks. Please help me welcome the one. I think is also sold by lightning powder and who else is selling that now? I 
Vince Keeler, Gina, and Kendra for this. Uh, I think right now those are the only three places in this country that are selling it. So if you're interested, you might want to take a look at that and make some notes from it. Uh, Okay, we can have the slide projector and the, the lights off, and I guess we can leave enough lights on so you can write. Talk about the cut 
outsole methods, and that's going to take probably an hour, hour and 15 minutes. But before we talk about the cut methods, we, we need to understand what materials are being cut uh, you know, to, to be made into shoe outsoles. And there are basically uh, three sources. Uh, the first is calendar, uh, the second is pre-molded sheets, and the third would be uh, either specifically sized or oversized uh, outsole units like, like we're holding up. This is very important, uh, particularly the calendar method, so we're going to talk now just about the materials and then later we're going to talk about the cut processes. <coughs> calendar outsole material is material that, uh, well, first of all, it's a process that's, I think, found only in four uh, mills in this country, four uh, facilities. Uh, La Crosse, Wisconsin was where this slide was taken. They make the uh, L.L. Bean shoes, if anybody's ever bought a pair of L.L. Bean main hunting boots, they make the bottoms of those, of those shoes. They'll tell you in your L.L. Bean catalog that they're made in Maine. All they do there is stitch on the leather upper. Uh, the, the basic part of the shoe is made in lacrosse rubber. Uh, and in calendar, the calendar process, what they first will do at the factory is they'll take sulfur and rubber and various raw materials in a very sloppy part of the factory and literally shovel it into a big uh, Banbury mixer and they will make their own rubber and put their own coloring agents in it and they will roll it uh, eventually through some uh, calendar rollers such as you're seeing there. Uh, and this tube or cylinder of rolled up rubber has been prepared on another machine and just prior to be putting it here uh, it's gone through a series of rollers to heat it up and give it some kind of uniformity. And now they're taking it and putting it to the back side of the calendar machine. And you can see up at the top uh, that that rubber is going in below one roller and it's coming out between the others and going up over top. On the other side of this machine, as you will see in a moment, is a, a, a roller that has a design on it. And that design will be the outsole design. And here is a calendar roller with the design on it. Uh, this is typically, uh, this is a boot design, and uh, very often with, in fact most of the time with the calendar designs, uh, you will have either a difference in thickness, because the cylinder will be perhaps uh, thinner on one end than another, uh, or you will have some kind of an area in here that will say made in China or made in USA, which is one this little band or just a void area of design. And that would be used kind of as an approximate guide when the operator later on is cutting out the shoe so they know exactly where the heel should fall, approximately where the heel should fall. Bill, just for scale, how big is that roller there? Uh, that roller is about two-thirds the width of this table. It's perhaps about this big. And its uh, circumference can vary a little from machine to machine and factory to factory. But about two and a half to three feet around. Uh, typical of, of these rollers, if you look in this area here, you can see there's uh, quite a bit of damage to these uh, at various points. Here's another uh, chunk that's been taken out or a dent that's been put into the roller. Uh, here's the Made in USA that I was referring to. Uh, damage that is on these calendar rollers will be transferred to the rubber material, which is then cut into shoe outsoles. And uh, if it's a depression or a, a, a dent into this calendar roller, it will appear as a raised area on a shoe outsole. Um, I have a, a, an outsole which has been cut uh, from calendar material. And this has been vulcanized, so it feels just like hard rubber. Uh, and right where my finger is, there you can feel it. If it's too dark to see it, there's a, a little protrusion, uh, which is very similar to that type of uh, what would happen with that type of event. Uh, in contrast, the other one I'm passing around, uh, up approximately around this area, you will see there's some indentations into it. And the material, as we'll explain briefly or shortly, uh, that comes from this method before it's finalized and before it's vulcanized. It's very soft. It's kind of like uh, pie dough, not quite that soft. 
Uh, maybe modeling plate would be a better description. So when it's picked up, it will stretch. When it's handled, it will uh, just change its shape. And if anything sharp uh, should strike it or nick it, uh, you will have an accidental characteristic. So one of these has this little bump on it, and that's a raised area on the outsole. So that's from damage to the calendar roller. Uh, it would also be the same if later as we talk about molds. Uh, damage to a mold would result in a raised area. And uh, random type damage, uh, such as a cut that put on before the material was, was harder to be uh, the pressure. Okay, this is, a, this is a different factory, but it's the front of the machine. I've, slides that you take in factories don't always turn out like you should hope, so we've got a little mixture. Uh, this is this is a calendar roller of a different design and what you have your little strip here for made in USA. And as this material comes out the back of the machine, uh, it will come out between this design roller and a smooth roller and will come out onto a conveyor belt. And as it comes down the conveyor belt, it will be cut into some slabs which are approximately five feet long. Uh, the slabs are, uh, are going to be of unvulcanized rubber, and they're going to be very, very soft. And as that operator cuts them and lifts them up, they're going to stretch just a little and, and basically uh, will uh, be subject at that point from there on until the shoe is vulcanized. They're going to be subject to defects or random defects that they could acquire just from the handling of this material. The material is so sticky that they have to stack it uh, with a piece of canvas. There's actually a layer of about five of these, and they have some big racks that hold about 20 or 30. And uh, if they were to stick them uh, together, uh, they would immediately bond, and you wouldn't be able to separate them without destroying them. Okay, this is uh, a piece of uh, calendar material. Uh, this is a different stack arrangement. You can see the the layers in here, they, this particular factory uses a little bit different method question. I'm sorry, but the floor when you're talking about is stacking, then vulcanized rubber between canvas. Will the canvas impress on, this, on the layer below? Um, it, it, it could. I think the way that you can't see it here, but there's kind of a it kind of rests, the back side rests on the canvas and then nothing really ever touches the top. The, the next layer that comes down somehow is, there's a, a layer of air between them. But you will see on some slides later a person's fingerprint in this rubber. Yeah, I'm okay. Okay. To answer your question, yes, that's possible, but each factory will have their own different method. For instance, uh, this one here has a much more sophisticated, you can see, see the space between that and they will all have that because, in answer to your question, if they did make contact with the top of the rubber, it would change, it would impact the design, it would put defects on it. Okay, but what I'm trying to show in this particular uh, slide is that uh, this does not have that made USA strip, but it is thicker on one end, and this will be the heel side, and this will be the sole side. And also, a lot of these uh, materials will have just a void design, absolutely nothing at all, and they will have a heel which is added later, and there'll be some slides of that later. Okay. Um, okay, is that better? I realize it's going to go down that way. Okay, the uh, outsole that's coming around that has the little raised depression is, is this one that's on this slide. And there's also, if you had a little bit more light in here, you can see that there are some other little uh, raised areas which are also as a result of mold damage. And now, uh, in looking at the variables which are associated with this calendar outsole material, uh, there are very bright variations and impurities in the rubber. Now, variations would be simply a little bit a different mix from factory to factory or within one factory. And impurities would, if you saw the way the uh, factory operates, it's a very dirty room and there's a lot of little grit and dirt that gets into this rubber. 
and they're not concerned, the industry is not concerned with outsole rubber if there's uh, grit and material in it. Uh, if it's the, um, if you can think of the LL being boot, you know, you have your outsole rubber and then you have some rubber that's on your upper, uh, goes around the side of the boot. And with regard to that rubber, which they also make in calendar, uh, they have a uh, cleaning system uh, because they want that rubber to be nice and smooth. Uh, flaws or damage to the calendar rubber can occur any time uh, after it's calendar, uh, including uh, those which are implanted on by the calendar roller itself and those from handling. Uh, variations caused by the adjustments to the machine. Uh, these can be the adjustments in the temperature. Uh, this material is heated a lot before it's calendar. And when it's put on those stacks, it will stay there usually for about 24 hours before, uh, at, before it is actually cut into outsoles. And during that time, there will be a, a significant amount of shrinkage, uh, which will change the design of the size. You can also have different tensions on that machine as uh, the speed of which it's coming through, which can stretch or, or cause it to be less stretch. Uh, this is where you're done in shrinkage and stretching of the soft material. Uh, random damage from handling the soft material. This not only is in the calendaring process, but later when the outsole is being cut and uh, even up to the point where the shoe is, is placed into the uh, vulcanizing chamber. Anyone who touches that outsole can plant damage to it. Uh, variations caused by the vulcanization are probably not real significant, but uh, most people uh, point those out. Is, is the vulcanization always done at the last step yeah. after the shoe is assembled? Or? Yeah, and the vulcanization is done in, in a large autoclave where a certain amount of heat and pressure uh, is, is put on the shoe. And they will take racks of shoes and the, the chamber may be half the size of this room and roll them in maybe several hundred shoes and have a big bolt type door. And just it's just like your little vulcanizer in a, or autoclave. <coughs> laboratory but it's one that you can walk into um, and what it does is it just in, in speeds up the bonding and sulfur bonding and all of these unvulcanized parts in other words not only the outsole but the uh, boxing strips which uh, which would run around the perimeter of the shoe uh, little labels that may be stuck on uh, on the back of toe caps uh, size labels anything at all which is unvulcanized uh, and which is very soft basically what they call green rubber, will bond together and become hard and permanent and permanently attached uh, in that vulcanization process. Okay, that was calendar material. Uh, Pre-molded outsole material would be a second category that a factory could choose from uh, if they were making shoes with one of the cut processes. Uh, typically, this is material which is made usually at a third party company. For instance, this particular 30 by 40 inch sheet of outsole material is made by uh, Monarch Rubber Company. This is from a few years ago. And it's used on the Nike Cortez shoe. And I think I saw one last night, somebody was wearing it, white. Anybody want to test? I saw it in the distance. I could wear it kind of little bit. Um, so typically a, a pre-molded sheet like this would not be soft. You could handle this all day and not change it at all. The way it comes out of the mold is going to be the same as any other sheet of pre-molded material that comes out. Uh, the variations uh, will occur when a portion of this material is cut out for an outsole. Uh, a third category of uh, a third choice that a manufacturer could have uh, would be either oversized or specifically sized pre-molded outsoles. And when I say oversized, uh, they will make this outsole much larger than what it will be finally on the shoe, uh, just to give them a certain amount of leeway in a particular process. And we'll see some examples of why they need it to be a little bigger. 
And uh, so because this will not be its original final size, because part of this perimeter is going to be cut off, and there can be variations in the way that's cut, uh, this is also significant. There is also, there are also some, some outsoles which are uh, specifically sized and molded. Uh, now this may look very much like the one you just saw, but this one's a little bit smaller. And there's characteristics that when you find a shoe uh, that's been made, uh, if you understand the different possibilities, you can look uh, at the microscopic characteristics on the side of the shoe, and you can tell if it was a specific size outsole such as this one, or if it was one which was much larger and cut down. This is a, a two pieces of material from South in Pennsylvania, and this is just a contrast. This is a little piece from a large pre-molded sheet, just like that herring mode, and I'll pass that around. And also, this one on the right I'll pass around. You might want to notice that as this comes around, uh, there will be a very thick area here, much thicker than the rest of it. And one clue when the shoe is finished is the very smooth sides of well, this side here and this side here, which you can see. It'll still have its shiny, rubbery look as opposed to a uh, ground down look. And that, that's a clue if you see it on a shoe and you still see that shiny uh, side in the thicker areas. Uh, sometimes you'll see both, you see the grinding coming to a point, but as long as you see any of that shiny material, you know that that was the original size of this outsole. So you know there wouldn't be any variables, or at least a lot of variables, with regard to the uh, cutting of that. Okay, those are the, the three sources of, uh, of materials for the cutting processes. I, I have a question. Sure. Back on this. That particular cell is kept from a big sheet with those uniform size things on it. How do they get the small ones and the, the void space for the brand name? Okay, I'm sorry. This, this was uh, showing a contrast. This would be from a big pre molded sheet where all you had was the circles. And that manufacturer not only put a die on this and cut out this type, but they also had pre-molded, specifically sized outsoles made in this side. And you can look on a shoe and uh, tell that a shoe that has these small circles and a smooth side and this logo uh, fit perfectly in here and all of these other characteristics did not come from this kind of source where there typically would be more variables. I'm sorry, that might have confused me to put them up together. Okay, the two cut methods, which are primary cut methods. Incidentally, let me point out that uh, somebody made a comment uh, this morning when they looked at the shoe materials up here and they said, gee, that stuff's from years ago. Uh, what about all the fancy new shoes that are out on the market? And it was, it was actually a good comment. I'm glad he made it because uh, if, you, if you look out on the market, you will see all of the ones that are up here, but you'll also see a lot of newer ones. So what we're talking about this morning is basically an introduction to basic methods. And if you look at those new modern shoes that are made, they'll go back to these basic methods. And once you understand these, it's much easier to understand how the more modern shoes are made. Uh, the two cutting methods uh, would be die cutting, and that's where you would take that steel die uh, in a cookie cutter fashion and literally cut through material. And it, because it's so sharp and it's, it's struck with a hydraulic machine with a lot of force, it can be used with either the vulcanized, pre-molded uh, sheets or oversized outsoles, such as this. Or it can be used with a soft calendar material. It's not a picky one. They can, can use die cutting anyway. It can cut through anything. The one that is limited is the Wildman outsole cutting. Uh, and this can only be used with the soft, unvulcanized calendar material. It cannot cut through, that machine cannot cut through sheets of rubber or these pre molded uh, outsoles. So if you find a shoe 
and by virtue of, of characteristics of that shoe, which we will see shortly, you can tell that it's a Wellman cut shoe. Then you know it's a calendar material. Normally it's easier to look at the material and tell it's calendar than it is to tell if it's Wellman cut. But one or the other, uh, they go to, together. Talking about the die cutting first, and this is a picture of, uh, of two steel dies, one which is uh, in the position in the background, which would be if it was cutting through material on the table. And this one's turned upside down, and you can see it has a very sharp edge to it. Is that in focus or out of focus? It is. If you go into a factory that it uses dies, they will have a die for each half size, eight, eight and a half, nine, and so forth, left and right. Uh, they will have different size and shape dies for different designs. They won't have just one rack of dies for every shoe they cut. They make, Nike makes the Cortez, they're going to have a set of dies for that shape and all the sizes. They make another method of die cutting, a different design, they're going to have different shape dies for that design. Okay, this is a picture of an operator in a factory taking a die and with the assistance of what they call a flicker machine, uh, she will swing this arm over the machine and by pressing the buttons on the back of it, the machine will quickly come down and press this sharp area of this die through this material. This happens to be the soft calendar material with the thicker uh, peel area. Now notice on this particular die, there's some markings here. And some dies and some factories will have guides in them which help the operator approximate the position of where that cut should be. Other ones do not have that. And as you'll see, it depends on the material. Uh, all of these factories operate on the more the person makes, the more money they get paid. So there, if you talk to operators, and I've talked to many of them, you start talking about you do this exactly this way every time. They, most of them can't comprehend what you're trying to ask them. They, they just have not, they've been working there for 15 or 20 years trying to do it as fast as they can, and along comes some smart aleck and says, if you put it this way, exactly the same every time. And they just, just really don't know what you're talking about. Uh, but there are some, if you look at all of the factories, some have outstanding quality control, and they're really trying to, to come out with a nice, perfect product, and others don't even think about it. So. Here's an example with a, a little die to give that person an approximation of where they want that die to be. Of course, this die can twist this way, this way, and it will still move up and back a little. And uh, this particular design is face down, so you can't see it. They're cutting it backwards because it's probably going to be uh, pulled around a shoe. Uh, but it, it also can uh, be left or right along as this design changes along the calendar roller. Uh, typically of a die cut shoe, and I'll pass this one around. This is this is from calendar material, but see it's been vulcanized, it's a sample, they put it in the vulcanization chamber, so it's not soft anymore. But it, this is die cut from calendar material. This particular one has a raised heel area, this is thicker. Uh, if you were to look on the side of this shoe, typical of a die cut, particularly of the softer material. Uh, the cutting in this case came from the top down to the bottom and left a series of striations uh, from the die. And the top edge of this uh, was pulled over a little, it's over the side. You can see how this kind of comes over the edge. And that's simply from the material sticking to the side of that die as it passed down and kind of getting rolled over. Uh, this is a pair of 69 cent flip flops and in these you can still see this die cut characteristic and in another slide you can see the way this material is, is pulled over. Uh, with 69 cent flip flops, I'll pass these around, uh, they're not going to take the time in the factory to wrap a strip around the side or to uh, grind this particular striation off. 
but most of the time you will not see these characteristics when you finish shooting. Uh, with regard to die cutting, uh, the exact position of the, of the die or the material is very significant because it's very, very slight movement will change the overall, uh, particularly around the perimeter, be very noticeable, the overall design. The size and shape of the die uh, is significant because you cannot take different size dies or different shape dies and result with an overall household that's the same. Um, there may be restrictions uh, of the way that die is positioned on the material uh, because of either the material design, and by material design I would mean if you had that sheet of herringbone, uh, you could cut that material out with the herringbone running left to right, but I think if you cut it running from the toe to the heel, you probably wouldn't sell many shoes, and typically it wouldn't be functional in that, or flexible in that particular position. So that's, that's what I mean by the uh, restriction of the material design. Later you'll see if you have a material which is question. Later you'll have if you have a material which is simply textured, uh, then you can turn that die in any direction and get a lot more variables. Uh, restrictions of uh, the factory operation, uh, that would be uh, factories which put uh, markers on the die or somehow try to have cuts which are fairly close or closely approximate one another versus a factory which has nothing like that at all. And typically you're going to get a lot of variables in one and less than another. Um, the die cutting, of course, you remember that you can use any kind of pre-molded or counter material. Uh, with regard to the position of the die, this is a picture looking down from the top of the die over some herringbone material. And you can see if this die was just turned a little bit this way or this way, mm -hmm. if it was moved in the same angle, left or right, or forward or backwards, just a very, very small amount, you would have a distinguishably different outsole. Uh, if you took uh, four identically shaped and sized outsoles uh, and placed them pretty much side by side over here in the material, if you looked down in the heel area first, and look from one to the next and follow the, the perimeter, uh, you'll see there's a significant difference in the way that that outsole is cut. Now, again, if this factory had a little mark up here and down here, and so we want you to put those marks pretty close to the peaks of that hearing no pattern, then your variables would not be as great. But again, because these factory operators are trying to turn out hundreds of thousands of these a day, and that, that is their bread and butter, they're going to only be approximately doing that, and you still will get variables. Uh, sure. Would it be fair to say that the cheaper the, the, uh, the shoe, that uh, the more variable could be in that particular doctor? Generally speaking, common sense would dictate that, but uh, uh, I, I think because you have a, a worldwide footwear market where in this country, you have a whole different range of qualities and in other countries you do as well and the ranges of pace and that kind of all gets jumbled up and you really don't see that any evidence of that yeah. uh, common sense would dictate that but just on a general scale and you can find a great deal of variables in expensive shoes and, and a lot of times uh, relatively few and cheap shoes <coughs> we have a uh, material similar to that black circular material. Uh, uh, in this particular material, as opposed to the herringbone, where you had to run it basically pretty much up and down, you could put these uh, in this direction or this direction and make your cuts. And you can reverse the shoes as well. And this is this is very common a lot of times. In fact, you just get a little bit more in uh, from that material. Uh, the one on the left and the one on the right are essentially the same shape, but they're different sizes. Uh, and the one in the middle, of course, is a different shape. And typically, uh, if you're referring to the entire axle, you will not get or cannot get the same pattern 
uh, if the size of shape changes. Uh, if you're looking at a very small area of, of that shoe outsole, though, you could get a repeat uh, in different shapes and sizes in a small area. Uh, this is a case uh, from a number of years back where the subject had four pairs of hearing bone shoes. Uh, fortunately, and this is a this is a good good lesson to learn, is uh, what I'm sure you're you're aware of. Uh, when they arrested this person, they not only had an arrest warrant for him, but a search warrant simultaneously for where he was living, and they obtained one of these pairs of shoes. Uh, I think this one he was wearing, uh, and this one and two others similar to it were found uh, at his mother's house where he was residing. Uh, this was an impression of soil uh, from behind the, one of the victim's houses. And this particular material, we, incidentally, these, the other two shoes were also herringbone, which you could, uh, one was Nike, but a different model, and the herringbone angle was quite a bit different. And the other one was a 90 degree angle. I think it was Jaguar or Jaguar or some kind of shoe I've ever seen since then. And these two were identical in size, color, brand name, everything. Uh, the only difference is this one was a little bit more worn, and the only other differences would be the manufacturing variables. Now, we mentioned those sheets of uh, herringbone design, and I neglected to tell you when I had that picture up there. You can visualize that 30 by 40 inch sheet of herringbone material. Uh, very often, every six inches or four inches or eight inches, uh, they will have or can have uh, a logo uh, as a part of that molded sheet. And then, essentially, what me what that means is uh, from that sheet, the person will, if your logo was here, uh, well, let's say this is a sheet and here's the logo, they're going to approximately put that die. So when it cuts it out, uh, the logo is going to appear somewhere in this part of the shoe outsole. And in this particular case, uh, these shoes were cut from a pre-molded sheet of material that had many logos uh, spaced across the sheet. Uh, you can see that just the size of the logos are different. The quality control of a very good company in this particular instance was, is it important to them? As long as it says nice question. Would the logo put on at the same time the uh, brain logo? Yeah, it, it would be a huge sheet bolt that would be filled with uh, rubber material and molded. And it would just have uh, 30 by 40 inches approximately of herringbone design and many of these logos spaced so that they could put dyes in different places and cut out material. But that's all done in, in, in that one molding process. Yeah. So, Essentially, because of the different size of this and the fact that this was and this was put on different spots of the mold, where this herringbone intersects this logo uh, is going to vary, and that, that's indicated by one of the arrows. There. You could follow that around the logo and see that there was differences all around it. Uh, in addition, because of the uh, the way that die is placed over, you can see the direction of the herringbone here versus here. Uh, is in, in a different direction. And if you look over at the question impression, you can see that this impression corresponds with the uh, shoe on the right and not at all with the shoe next to it. Uh, another thing which is interesting to notice uh, is that because that die can move over left or right or up or back and twist, that if you were to count the number of these bars from um, the logo area back and the top of the logo area forward, uh, as well as here uh, where you can see the corner of that logo area uh, on the question impression, you'll find that, uh, for instance, these two shoes have a different number of bars. The die was not in the same position. Again, uh, this can not only be used to contribute toward identification, but to also help you eliminate shoes. Many times you will have a very small portion of an impression, and you may have this shoe. And you may be able to eliminate that based on that information and understanding how that came about. Another question? Sure. Yeah, I'm sorry if I say something I missed the first time. Uh, based on that, that, 
that you can use as an exclusion, but not solely as an identification. No, and I, I said at the very beginning that in, in some rare instances we can identify shoes before they're worn. But in most cases, we're simply using it to enhance the examination. And as you'll see as we go through this, there are a lot of these that you're going to start scratching your head and say, well, why can't we identify it? And you'll see that I'm actually being very conservative with this material. But it's certainly a lot of material here which, you know, we can now use if we understand this that we couldn't before. Now, this would, this would not be an identifying feature, nor would the cover. But it certainly helps you. And again, looking at sheet material, uh, if you're using a, looking at a textured material, you can see that uh, the dye can be placed in any position, in any direction. And the, the design is so fine that just the very slightest movement is going to be easily discernible. And if we took, in this case, three outsoles. They weren't all from the same uh, sheet, but they were from a sheet made from the same mold in this particular company. And uh, we took three of the samples they had of the same size. And I put these little marks in there just to show where the repeated design was on the molds there. But it shows you can orientate uh, the direction of a guy, <coughs> excuse me, uh, in just about any direction on a sheet to come out with an acceptable outsole. So if you see a, an item that has this kind of a textured material, basically directionless, uh, design, uh, typically you're going to find to uh, cut faster and to uh, save the material. It wouldn't be sloppy like this, but you would find many, many different angles that that dye was used on top of the material. So your variables would be even greater. Uh, this is the flip flops that were coming around in the 69 cent uh, flip flops. And this particular design would probably typically cut, be cut this way or this way. Uh, and you can see very easily with that pattern, it's a good example of how you can easily discern the variables in the cut. There's a little bonus on, on these because you have the uh, plugs and the thongs that come through the material. So even if you had a very small limited uh, amount of the impression, that thong plug would help you uh, very much. In, examining the question of pressure with the shoe. Uh, these, these types of shoes uh, are still popular and several years ago were extremely popular for joggers. Uh, the, uh, there's the, when they were first made years ago, they were all almost made the same way. Now the industry has come up with so many different ways to put them together that it can almost be confusing. But if you understand all of the possibilities, you can very easily go into a shoe store and take them off the shelf and tell exactly what's happened in every one of them. Uh, I think that uh, before we get into this, though, what, there's probably about 15 or 20 slides for this type of process. We might want to take a five or 10 minute break and, and uh, come back. <laughs> Is that what she wants? Okay, we were starting to talk about uh, this shoe, and I put this type of shoe under die cutting because, as you will see, many of the finished size and shape outsoles of this type of shoe are die cut. Now, there are others that look like this that are molded or that are pieced together with individual like the white, blue, and black layers, or whatever colors they may be, ones that have actually been cut so specifically that they can just put them on top of one another by hand, and they'll fit fairly perfectly. But to try to keep the organization of this, I put all of these in this section we're going to talk about. And hopefully, uh, when we get through the next few slides, you'll see how it would be possible to go into a shoe store and pick up a shoe such as this one or this one, and by looking at the characteristics of it, uh, be able to see it is easy to tell how the shoe is put together. Uh, or at least be aware that that varies from shoe to shoe and you can contact the factory. <clears throat> In this... So are those two layers cut independently and stitched together, or is it two layers cut together that are cut at the same time? 
I'll get into that. This is just like the first slide to let you know what kind of shit we're talking about. Ask the question, because sometimes I don't have any. Uh, while, this, while this is up here, you can see on this, uh, for instance, here's some clues. You have a, a blue line between the uh, midsole unit and the upper. Now, later on, we'll talk about shoes where the upper is lowered into a mold cavity, the molding processes. The mold halves come together, come up right tight against it, and material is injected in, and this material will be directly bonded to the shoe. And you'll have characteristics which will help you recognize that as well. But when you see blue, you know that wasn't the case. You know that this was made and then glued to the upper. Okay. Other clues you have in here, you can see uh, that along the black edge and the blue and the white, they are all in one plane. And if you were to look, you could see they were ground together at one time. So there's three materials were put together. A grinding wheel came along and ground them all perfectly even. Now, these shoes can be made, and originally, we go back into the 70s when this type of shoe, uh, maybe early 70s, uh, was, was typically real popular. Uh, you would have the oversized uh, bottoms, and that oversized bottom, I think earlier I mentioned to you, you would see why it was oversized. Uh, they would have at the, the back feet, here's a gray kind of a horse shape, horseshoe shape uh, material, and then two layers of white material. Uh, you can see the division there. And this material at another stage in the factory has been cut uh, and put together. And layers of blue have been put on it. And this is just a heat activator type kind of conveyor belt. And as it comes down to this operator, by hand she is placing the midsole units uh, together with the black oversized outsole unit. Then that oversized unit, and if you were to, to run your fingers up and down this edge, uh, they may be an eighth of an inch or a quarter of an inch off. They're going to be very, very much uh, you know, out, of, out of line with one another. But because they're all oversized, as it's dyed and it's placed over, and now you don't have as much room for variation, uh, but you still can move that dye forward or backward or twist it side to side. <coughs> And that die will then, oops, I thought I had a picture of it being cut. All right, uh, that, that die will then, when one of those clicker machines, be forced through that material. Uh, these are two uh, pieces of uh, what's left after a couple of those what they call blocker units where you have all those different components together and then it's die cut. Here are two that are left and you can see down here one, this is a lot wider than this. And look up at the top, uh, you can also see this is a little narrower here. So on one of them the die was more to the left than on the other. That's not a great deal of variation, but a lot of times you can see a lot more. <coughs> To give it that wedge-shaped design in cases where you have uh, a midsole and an outsole that are oversized and cut, uh, at that point you're going to have a straight edge. And to give it that, that wedge shape or flare design, the shoe will be run against a, uh, a grinding wheel. <coughs> As luck has it, whenever you go to a factory, they have the straight grinding wheel instead of the flare one. So, these particular shoes are be given a, a straight edge, but what it is doing is giving it a uniform grinding from the midsole portions and the outsole. If this was a flared or wedge-shaped grinding wheel, you would have that flare design. Excuse me. How, how come they do that in, in addition to die cutting? Is it just the, for aesthetic reasons or when it's a straight? Uh, uh, I, I don't honestly know the answer to that. You can speculate that that wedge shape may have been, uh, maybe, I don't know, if Nike came out with that first, or it might have been a more stability, or it may have been aesthetic or a combination. 
No, no, I mean, why do they grind it? They're going to have a straight solo as a finish. Oh, yeah, oh why straight solo. Why do they grind it? Well, it's it's one way of taking a midsole of a white, uh, bouncy material and putting it together with an outsole that's very durable and putting them together uh, with glue and coming up with one nice smooth edge. You know, there's, there's other ways, of course, to come out with that straight edge, uh, molding or so forth. And there's, you know, that's why we're going over the die cut and eventually the molding cuts. There are many ways to make shoes. And you'll see some examples of where the factories have taken some of these basic methods and, and put on their own little modifications and really changed it. Uh, so uh, by understanding some of the basic things that you can recognize, then you can, you can also appreciate that each factory you know, is going to have a modification. This again just shows the uh, this glue line, and you can see that this particular is only one uh, midsole unit and this edge uh, are ground uh, all the way down uniformly. Question? Is it an issue if they, they either cut it or they grind it, or are they cutting and then grinding? They're, they're first cutting it with that die. Is that, does it end up uneven, even though we're cutting? No, no, it won't be uneven, but a number of those dye striations and it would be rough. And it would not have the final shape, it wouldn't have the flare shape, it would be straight. Uh, so even if they want it straight, they're going to grind it to make it nice and even. Not on those cheap lift blocks. Okay, here's a, here's, you can see this light brown blue line. There's basically uh, two white sections and then the outsole. <coughs> and these were taken uh, from Brooks in Massachusetts. These were destined to be a pair of shoes. We pulled them off the line as they were together. And you can see it here and here. Uh, look at this edge out here uh, versus this edge over here. Uh, now, granted, this is a left and right, but you would typically get the same variables between whites and whites and whites and whites. You can also see from the grinding, you can see little pieces of stray rubber uh, sticking down in here, uh, where that rubber has been ground off and it's still sticking on a little. And you can go in shoe stores and find shoes with that still on. Okay, now, in this kind of a shoe design, if you were to turn a shoe over, such as this one here, and the one on your right in the slide, and you were to look at the bottom of that, uh, you could presume, I'm not saying that you wouldn't call it back and verify it, but common sense and the economics of it will tell you that this is going to be from a sheet of material. They're not going to mold this just a little bit bigger and then cut it down with absolutely nothing else on it. Uh, this kind of a fine pattern uh, oriented, so you could have cut it this way or this way from a sheet. Uh, then the uh, combine with the midsole and then ground down and you can still see uh, some of the fine pieces from the grinding. Uh, very, very slight m movement of that die is going to result in very discernible uh, variables in this case. And then over here you have a situation where you have, uh, when you look at the shoe as it's passing around in here, you can see that this heel piece and from here to here, we're actually separate. But in both instances, if you look at the sides of uh, here and thicker portions, uh, and just looking at the asymmetrical design itself, that would tell you this didn't come from a sheet. And because of the smooth sides of here, it tells you that it was specifically sized. And you won't see any grinding along the edge. So you know that two shoes uh, made uh, with this specific size outsole, unless you see grinding marks, then are going to be the same. You know, really won't be any variables. Um, yeah, so. Okay, now we get into a little bit more uh, of a, a modern type of design. You still find those that, that are coming around, but. Uh, Typically, you will find uh, nowadays ones with uh, kind of a skin effect on them. Uh, you'll find these uh, 
heel stabilizers, anti-pronation and anti-supination devices. Uh, and this particular uh, this particular outsole uh, has had uh, two components, a gray one and a white one. And very common with the, and you can see it on, I think, that uh, burgundy shoe coming around. Very common with the ones where they used a light, soft material on the ground. It, they would get a lot of discoloration. So some of the factories and companies in order to do that are putting a skinny uh, on the edge of this. And that means that uh, they can't put that skin on and then grind it at the same time they're grinding this outsole. So uh, they have to piece these specifically. Uh, put the skin on, you can see the blue line right here. Uh, and they'll put that skin on so this and this and the outsole will be sized as perfect as possible uh, along with the, uh, in this case, this device here. And by hand, it'll be very carefully positioned together. I just want to get a couple of basic terms. You're referring to outsole. I also mentioned, uh, I heard you say midsole. What I assume that the midsole will be the center part of the sandwiching and the outsole is the bottom yeah. then? The outsole is the portion that touches the ground. In some cases, if it's a one-piece shoe, you basically have your outsole and no midsole. Okay. But in these, you may have one or two or more midsole components spliced together. Thank that you. would be the portion between the upper and the outsole. What, what's the skin consist of? Uh, I, I, I can answer that. There is a physical piece? Uh, that, that was done in a different location, Keith, and I, I don't honestly know. No, no, well, I, when, the, the term skin, is, it, is that the same thing as the boxing strip around the edge? No, no. It's, it's, uh, that piece is dipped or somehow that material is put on it. Yeah, it's very thin. You can, this was coming around, you can see it. Is that the skin that's between the midsole and then the touch upper? No, the upper? It's, it's just the surface of this gray and white area. Oh, that's and that's that's the, the burgundy shoe and the, uh, the blue shoe that's coming around. Look at the edge of that. It's, it's been round. It's very rough. This is going to be very smooth. And on one side of it, uh, they even have uh, E dash CAP, which happens to be uh, that year Brooks has meant something. If you look at their catalog, their E cap, whatever that is, meant something. And so this way, this missile won't discolor, uh, turn color. And now, as a result of this particular modification, you're not going to have any grinding. Anymore. You can readily see that when you pick up a shoe and look at it. Now, also typical uh, situations where they take the outsole and the midsoles that are specifically sized and they put them together, as common sense would dictate, those aren't going to fit perfectly together. And so you can run your finger over certain portions around it and feel where the outsoles sticking over a little on one side, not so much on the other. You can look at it microscopically and see that. And you can just start looking around and you can see as to whether it's ground or skinned and how well it meets. You can tell exactly what's happening. Question? Sure. Will that uh, skin come off? Is that something that can peel away? Uh, look, it, I've never seen a shoe that's done that. Uh, it doesn't look like it. It looks like it's so bonded. They use a, a tremendous variety of glues in the footwear industry and they heat activate them and all of them. Normally, you don't, if, as you go through factories, the years I've gone through these, I haven't encountered much of that kind of problem. Once these things go together, they're together. And any shoe that might show a problem of because maybe the glue wasn't working or something wasn't applied properly, they'll catch it as a problem of control. Yeah, I've never seen any of them. I mean, I think if you, know, if you caught a nail on it, uh, it's going to make a nail hole or, or rip it just like it would if it wasn't there. It's pretty much part of, of this. So it's just like a coat, a similar to like a coat of paint over one corner of the heel? Yeah, no, it goes all the way around. Oh, uh, okay. I, was yeah, I, <clears throat> I wish I could be more definitive and give you answers about the skin. The skin itself is not significant in your exam. Just the presence of it versus the ground surfaces. And this particular skinning process was done by Brooks at a northern Massachusetts location out where we were at. And uh, I didn't see fit to, to make a whole separate trip just to see the side of the shoe skin. And it didn't seem to have any effect on, on what we were interested in. Uh, but 
it's to, the, to avoid the discoloration process, of course, they are able to, to put their own logos and all on the side as well. Excuse me. You said they discolor because of what? A lot of shoe material is just simply discolored uh, in the atmosphere, in the sunlight, and the moisture. And, and uh, if, if you've had any of those old white wedge type jogging shoes, you look at them, you may see some yellowing or some hardening or, or turning gray. And a couple of the ones coming around, you see that. And I guess they were concerned with that. And this particular factory is using this process to, to eliminate it. Uh, this is going to be a little bit better picture. Uh, this is that same outsole upside down. Here's your heel uh, stabilizer. Uh, here on the other side of it, you can see their uh, their little logo uh, trademark. Uh, you can see that the skin uh, gives it a little different texture. Uh, this particular area here is protruding out uh, further than this area here. So if you were to rub your finger across there, you will feel that. Uh, actually, what happens here, this little area here, as you see when we get into the molding process, is uh, when you mold, when you have a mold and you mold the top and bottom, you'll get material coming out called flash. And what you're seeing uh, by this little lift is the flash that was resulting from this piece being molded. And if they were to try to trim that right up against this, then they're going to tear into that. So they're going to have tiny little ridges that vary around the circumference of the shoe. And that makes it impossible to meet this perfectly. Question. How did they get the logo on the side of the insole? That's part of that skinning process again that I didn't see. It's just, I would imagine they've taken that and somehow when they put that skin on it's been molded into it. But again, I apologize for that. I guess I'm going to have to go back. <laughs> I don't think they'll believe me when I go back and say, hey, I'm going to go to Massachusetts to see how the shoe skin is. This, the presence of it is what's significant, not how it's put on. Uh, if you had a, uh, a case where you got this shoe uh, and you had a cast of an impression that allegedly was made by the shoe and you had this in the sidewall of the cast, then you might want to call the manufacturer and find out if this appeared in the exact same spot or could vary, maybe there would be some significance to that. But just to point out this process, I'm trying to explain the question. Yeah, the skin, I'm sorry. But, uh, is that hand put on by hand? I, I don't know. I, I, I would say that this is all <laughs> one time. <laughs> Somebody told me I'm late. <laughs> Uh, with that same sole, here's a, a finished shoe. And uh, again, if you found the shoe in the factory or, or in the store, uh, although it's not with magnification, it's not at real evident here. If you, if you were to take that shoe and you know go around it, maybe even had a UV light, usually it's very obvious. You'll find some evidence of blue. Uh, you'll be able to see uh, the, the uh, midsole and the unevenness of the outsole with it. Uh, the side of the uh, outsole portion, you can see it's shiny there because it's a uh, smooth, reflective surface from the side of the mold that it came from, hasn't been ground away. All of these characteristics would be very obvious. And that's going to tell you that this was specifically sized, uh, the flashing was trimmed a little unevenly, it was hand attached to the skin and then sole, and then it was glued to the shoe. So if there are any questions about variables, or anything which you felt as a result of that was significant in either eliminating or identifying your shoe, uh, your question or question. Uh, if it wasn't evident itself by your observations, you would be able to call, uh, see what I said, Brooks, but this is uh, New Balance, New Balance, Brookville, Massachusetts, I'm saying, New Balance shoe. You can call New Balance and say, with regard to model number, where you make these and talk to the factory people and ask them some questions on their way from Okay, any questions about the die cutting process? And just so you're not confused, uh, when we first started talking about the die cutting, we had that little white uh, piece of die cut material from the calendar or herringbone pattern, sheet material, and then we uh, uh, 
uh, had just flip flops, and then we came up to uh, this type of shoe. And before we go on, uh, let me hand this around. This particular shoe, the whole bottom, the white and the, the black portion, uh, are molded. Uh, and they're, they're not glued together. They're molded in one piece, uh, and then they're glued to the upper of the shoe. And what they've done here, uh, in kind of a cheap way, but you'll see this a lot, in order to make it look like uh, it was maybe a little bit more elaborate of a molding process, there's a little oval window here and here, and it's been painted gray. And you can look at this until it's been painted. If you have, again, the right light and magnification, it's very easy to see that. So uh, if you run your finger or look around it, you'll see that there's a tremendous amount of consistency that you don't get on that other shoe. And you should be able to discern between this and the one that, was, that came around before. Those are the midsole and the outsole are two separate materials that are added to mold? Uh, they could be, uh, to speak just in general terms rather than specifically, they could be a two color, two step process. It could be compression molded or injection molded. Um, and they, they likewise, if they were two separate processes, they could be different materials for all colors. This one is, is actually two separate processes. The black was, was molded at a separate time than the white, and then they painted the gray on the side. Just to, for some, I guess to match the gray on the shoe. You, you had an out, uh, a slide earlier, an outsole that had a, a blue portion and a black portion along quite a ways back. Quite um, a ways? Yeah. That, maybe you added two, two steps or. Uh, Okay, I know what you're talking about. You're talking about one of the oversized outsoles that had right, yeah. blue around it and then uh -huh. black, yeah. Okay, that's uh, that was spliced together. Yeah. Uh, it, well, it can be either way, though. It can be spliced together or it can be uh, molded together. We'll show some molding where they use different colors in all. Oh, okay. Ask me that. Like, well, I, it's easier for me to explain them than to get to molding as to how that can happen in different ways than you try to build the head. Okay, uh, Wellman outsole cutting. Now, this is the other cutting process, and it's, it's so named Wellman outsole cutting because it utilizes the Wellman outsole cutting machine. Uh, remember now, Wellman cutting can only use the soft, unvulcanized calendar material. Okay, so anytime you can establish that a shoe was made with a Wellman cutting process, that confirms that it's the unvulcanized material. Normally, it's easier to look at the material of the shoe and tell that it's calendar material. Yeah. Another variable would be the size and shape of the template. Uh, this is a, a metal template, uh, which I'll pass around, which uh, you'll see in a slides is placed beneath the Wellman cutting machine head and a small little knife blade about two inches long uh, will run around this size and shape template and cut the material out. This template will be pressed down against the material uh, and then that knife blade will plunge through the material, run all the way around and lift out with the template. Now, some templates will have a size on them. And bear in mind, again, this calendar material is soft. As the template is pressed down, it will implant the size of the shoe in that cut outsole. You can see this when we move a little further. Uh, the exact position of the cut, just like the die in the die cutting process can vary, you will see uh, that the position of the cut with regard to uh, Wellman, the Wellman process will also vary. Uh, restrictions imposed by the material design, uh, if you have a raised heel area or no heel, that is a, an outsole where uh, it's going to be cut out and the heel area is going to be totally blank, and then later on uh, either a die cut or a molded heel will be attached to it, and we'll see some slides of that. Uh, all of these types of things uh, may limit the variables in a particular shoe. 
is well in the name of the company, or is that just the name of the individual? Uh, it's it's the, the name of this machine, oh, and uh, it's the it's the only company that made it. I believe there's uh, around the Chicago area, there's some people that still service and wait a second, I can't get back. That's the calendar. Order. I have. If you were to talk, if you were to go, and I have done this three years in a row. You went to the footwear convention and it used to be in Atlantic City, but it's in Boston now. And you walked in there and went around the entire place and asked, me, what about the welding machine? And I've done this. Nobody knows what you're talking about. Uh, but if you look in the in the shoe store, particularly <coughs> typically uh, canvas type shoes, uh, which are most often lady shoes, but are men's shoes as well. Uh, boots, uh, farm-made shoes, uh, where labor is, is in some cases a lot less than uh, this machine is used quite frequently. This process and the calendar process is used quite frequently. In this country, uh, the, the welding machine, which is, so, is associated, can only be used with the calendar material. You need so many employees to mix that rubber and do all the steps going through that calendar process and also the various steps involved in this process, but labor-wise, it just simply is not uh, economical to, uh, to make a shoe. There are four companies that I know of uh, that still use calendar rubber in the welding process. The Cross uh, Rubber in uh, Cross Wisconsin is one. And there's one in some little town outside of Chicago, and I can't think of the name, I know there's one in New York. There's, there's just something, that there's one other, uh, and it's just slipped my mind. There's, there are four of them still left. This, this picture was taken at Bader Rubber Company in Aberdeen, Maryland, uh, in the late 70s, and uh, for years now, this factory has not used this process. <coughs> What's happening here is, uh, if you see beneath this, this is a long cut slab of the calendar material. And this, you can see underneath of it is a metal plate, and then there's a long metal uh, table. And what's happening is if they put this slab of rubber right on the metal table, they wouldn't be able to slide it down as it cuts. So they have to put that on a cutting board, and then that slides real easy. Uh, right down here is that metal template, uh, such as the one that's going around. <coughs> and you can't see from here, but there's a little knife blade that will run around that template. Uh, this operator will slide that that part through, that, that whole slab through, and cut about seven or eight uh, individual uh, outsoles from it, and it will probably take him about two and a half or three seconds to do that whole thing. Uh, and each time he has to stop and start by hand, and with the pedal he has to operate this machine. Uh, if, if you saw a video and saw this actually happening, Knife blade and the screw advancing against the game. Sound is just going, and he's just moving it down just as smoothly as can be. Because uh, he's probably been doing it for 25 or 30 years, but it's a, a very quick process. Uh, also, the way that this slab on that plate is aligned, if it's just coming through on a little angle, as you'll see, uh, that would cause the pattern to shift along the cut. And of course, where these slabs are randomly cut as they come off that conveyor belt, the beginning portion is going to be in a different part of that design each time. So you get a lot of variables in this. Uh, here's a little closer picture of the welding head. Beneath here, you can barely see the template. There's a better picture of that later. And after that material is cut out, then the operator has to, to pull each of those outsoles from this, uh, the remaining portion of the unvulcanized rubber. Now, you can see how soft that material is. The toes sticking up by itself. And you can see that uh, where his arm and elbow is and all that, uh, there's going to be some characteristics that can be implanted on these, on these outsoles. <coughs> this is just uh, some of the templates uh, that were at that location time, such as the one that's coming around. 
Uh, this is a different machine. This is a lacrosse, a little bit cleaner operation. Here's your metal table, and this slab over here has uh, just gone through. Here's your template, and right here, you can't see the knife, but that's the little device holding the knife, which comes down. Uh, that's a, a just a slab of material that's going to be cut, and here's your, uh, I don't know if that says maybe, I don't think, that might be a word or something, but uh, up here, this is all blank, and this is going to be an outsole that has no heel on it that a heel is added to later. Okay, uh, I must have taken 10 shots of this thing operating so fast, trying to get one where the template was actually touching the rubber. And I thought I had it, but <laughs> I didn't. Here's the little knife right here. And this plate will be pressed down against the rubber, and then this knife plate will run around and will then lift back up. Here you can see the no design in the heel area. So you can see that relative to the heel, uh, the heel area of the template sticking out over this area. Okay, those are some of the uh, outsoles that were cut from that. Now typical of a Wellman cut, you get this beveled edge, or angled edge. And again, in the finished shoe, uh, you're typically not going to see that, although in boots you, you can see that. Some uh, you can adjust the angle of that knife blade as well. <coughs> also, when that knife blade comes around that material, uh, remember it's uh, it's a real sticky, doughy type of rubber, and the knife blades do tend to get dull. People <coughs> change them quite frequently, and they're really kind of pushing their way through that rubber as much as cutting it. And so, uh, just like uh, if you shovel snow or push through anything, it goes off to both sides and you get a, a little lip of rubber uh, that occurs along the top. And then it's possible that that, uh, that lip or something similar to it could, could appear in a shoe or an impression. Here's a, an example of a, a slab where seven ounce holes have been cut. This one was removed. You can see how they kind of just pop out. Uh, <coughs> remember that this slab is suspended between the machine and just turn just a little bit either way. Uh, then uh, this particular cut is going to be moving up and down on the design. like in your die cut uh, where you're, you're cutting out a pattern material, you're going to get variations in the edge characteristics. Uh, obviously, the word made in USA here, the M starts here, and the South Soul starts with the F of the D. Uh, you can see that quite easily. But it, you can also see the rest of the design varies as well. Notice the black arrow on the right, uh, as well as over here, you can see there's been some damage. It's a depression in the outsole, and that's occurred uh, as a result of the handling of that outsole up to this point. Uh, not as visible, I don't think, to you, but there's also kind of a trough or depression running through here, this black arrow. Uh, the red arrows at the top on each one uh, show the very obvious uh, position of made in USA, which repeats around the calendar door. Incidentally, uh, well, there's a better slide I'll talk about in that. But you can see that the 10 in this sound sole and this one here uh, are in quite a different position. And the reason for that, as I explained, is the 10 in this case, in many cases, is actually pressed into the outsole by the template as it comes down on top of that material. And if that material is angling through that machine, and very rarely would it be traveling straight, then 
uh, this number is going to be migrating each time. So if you have seven different households, as you saw in the couple slides before, that 10 will move each, each household in a slightly different position. Uh, also, in uh, some designs, there will be areas where either the roller did not have a, a design such as this, either it was smooth, or it, since this material has a relative uniform thickness, uh, it goes through a series of smooth, smooth rollers first. It may just be a, a cavity or a void area on the counter roller. And this is basically a designless area. Uh, you're just getting a lot of air pockets and random type of characteristics in that area that just randomly occur on that rover as it's rolled. And so these kind of characteristics would be random characteristics. Here's a nice big uh, indentation to the bottom from uh, from handling. Okay, uh, one of the things I don't know. I mean, there may be a better slide, but one of the things that's uh, also uh, nice to note is that on your calendar roller. You will have maybe China or maybe USA or maybe Korea, wherever it might be. Uh, that may repeat, I don't know, 20 or 30 times around the world. But if you look at the, uh, the document examiners in here, if you look at the uh, specific features of the letters, uh, you will see that they're not identical. So uh, you may have quite a difference between this IM and this IM. Uh, the relative position here at the U on the end and so forth as it goes around the roller. Again, uh, this would seem to some of you, not all of you, uh, kind of a sloppy operation, uh, but this is very typical of what you're finding. Uh, another thing uh, to be aware of when the upper uh, is prepared on a on the last, on a metal foot form, uh, when that material in the upper comes around and is tucked by machines beneath and tacked to or glued to uh, the bottom of the shoe, and then of course that soft, calendared, uh, unvulcanized material uh, with the outsole design is going to basically be temporarily stuck on there uh, and, and pressed on there a lot of times with the machine. Uh, and it, when it vulcanizes uh, to it in the vulcanization chamber, this will bond to it. But when you have certain types of bulges, uh, very often that soft material will conform to those bulges. And typically, if you have a big bulge uh, normally up in this area on one side or the other, uh, you will find that that particular shoe, as it starts to wear, will wear, the pattern will wear off right beneath one of these bulges and may uh, be mistaken by you as a unique kind of a wear characteristic you might be trying to associate with the person, when in fact it's a, a due to a manufacturing characteristic. Uh, when they take the outsole and whatever other rubber components that are unvulcanized and they press them onto the shoe, they use a, a little device that has a little serration in this wheel, and the industry <coughs> refers to this as a stitching wheel, and they refer to the process as stitching, although it has nothing to do with needle and thread. Uh, they're pressing uh, the different rubber components together, and that's pushing down into the rubber, and it's leaving a mark. Uh, and what they're doing is they're trying to assure that all of those rubber components are going to stay together until they get through the vulcanization process. Once they're vulcanized, then they're permanently bonded together, but uh, they're trying to avoid any of them from popping off or not fitting properly. <coughs> that wheel, that stitching wheel, will leave this little print mark And on, uh, this is not an LLB shoe, but it's similar to their main lane boot. This is Sporto's. You can see that there's a lot of that stitch mark all throughout here. Uh, what they've done in this particular shoe 
uh, they run the calendar material and they've turned it upside down when it went beneath the Wellman cutter. Uh, so that uh, that bevel is in the opposite direction, and then they've taken that bevel as it gets thinner, they've taken and you know, brought it around and pressed it to the upper. In this case, the calendar material did not have any heel. This was all smooth and without design, and they've taken a molded heel, and they've attached it to the bottom of that shoe. Uh, you can do that with a, a latex material, just wet the heel with it and, and stick on there temporarily. And as you'll see, uh, sometimes they use a little tack and a string, which will protrude out the front of the heel to kind of wrap it around and hold it on there. And then when that gets vulcanized together, it will become one, one piece. Uh, here's a good view of the stitching. Uh, you, in, when you have the molded heel, Usually you won't see any stitching between here, but you can see it's kind of sloppy. Uh, if there's any gaps, they'll take a, a touch-up brush with some of that latex material of this color, and they'll just kind of fill it in. And then when that vulcanizes, that all becomes one. Does that stitching have any purpose? Other than, I mean, does it actually help hold the, uh, the two sections together? Or is it it, just, just, for... just temporarily. If they didn't send us through the vulcanization process at the end, and you just put the shoe in and start walking, this would all tear apart. But what it does do is it, is it presses these two together, gets any air out, makes a good solid contact. So that assuring that those areas of different rubber are contacting one point another completely so that there can be a bond when it goes into a vulcanization. This is very, very easy to discern. This is a molded heel with a very smooth side, straight edge as opposed to another one you'll see where uh, it's actually die cut, cookie cut type out of uh, the calendar material. So you can see that turned over edge like you did on the die cutting process. And this is the bottom of those boots and you can, this is a pair of boots which, uh, which I wear. Uh, and you can see that the heels are not placed exactly on. You have these labels in different places. You have the string coming out uh, this obviously got distorted somewhere along the way. And of course, your randomness of your cut is going to be different. <coughs> now, normally again with the molded heel, you'll probably have a mold number on there. It's a dead giveaway. It's usually on the leading edge. Uh, that, that means it's probably done its time. I always forget breaks, so I have to set my one. Uh, we'll just take you the slide and we'll break. <coughs> Uh, but you can see there's an awful lot of variables here. Just, just so that the R FLP doesn't need all the donuts, we're going to stop right here. <laughs> 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 